Dr. Arv Grabowskis uh, is here this morning. He's going to give us an update on diseases and fungicides. So thank you, Arv, for coming. So the first thing I want to talk about is barley yellow dwarf virus. If you remember last season, shortly after spring green up, a lot of our crop kind of looked a little yellow. And it carried on through to the harvest time. There was a lot of yellowing in, our, in the leaves of the plants. Uh, the symptoms that we saw out there are pretty much like these. It's a little bit hard to see that in, in this particular slide because these are our seedlings. But you'll see this sort of uh, uh, yellowing of the leaves, particularly from the leaf tip on down, sort of, sort of from the tip on down towards the base of the leaf, some yellowing. And particularly in wheat, you can also get some of this reddening or purpling kind of a symptom. And at the, uh, uh, when the heads are out, a lot of the symptom is uh, really kind of noticeable in the flag leaves. Probably most of the fields had somewhere between 10, uh, 15 to maybe 25 percent of the flag leaves showed this kind of a symptom. Well, this particular problem was barley yellow dwarf, which is a virus disease. It's a virus, uh, and like all viruses, they need a vector or some sort of organism to help bring it into the plant. Um, is this, am I still all right on this? Or kick out. Okay, all right. <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> all right. All right, very good. Um, virus diseases need another organism, a vector, to bring it into the plant. In this case, it's aphids, all right? So that uh, aphid activity is very important, and without the aphids, you don't get any barley yellow dwarf, all right? So the question is, First of all, how much in the way of losses do we have perhaps last season for barley yellow dwarf and is there anything we can do about it? And of course, because this season, particularly the earlier in the fall, late, uh, early winter when it was still kind of mild before we started going into fluctuations where we actually had a few days of winter kind of a thing in here, um, there were some aphids out there. So the question is, are we gonna have a barley yellow dwarf problem again? Uh, the important thing about barley yellow dwarf is to remember that the earlier the infection is, the more likely you're gonna have a severe loss, all right? In fact, it's the very early infections, shortly after planting, where you can get some stunting. So there's two major symptoms that this virus disease can produce, which is the discoloration of the leaves, which is fairly characteristic, and the stunting. Now, if, it, if you can barely tell in this picture again, because these are seedlings, but this pocket of plants here where the hand is, essentially is uh, uh, a couple of, couple of plants, series of tillers that got infected with barley yellow dwarf shortly after planting and they will basically remain this size the rest of the season. They are severely stunted, they won't produce a, a, a head, and this is where you can get some real significant losses. As time goes on, the stunting is a lot less, and in fact, it becomes not noticeable or not a problem, uh, depend, depending on when the infection occurs. So let's go into that a little bit. There's actually been a tremendous amount of work that's been done on barley yellow dwarf. There's actually a book out, talk about you know, uh, a narrow, spectrum uh, or kind of a geeky kind of a book is a book on 40 years of progress in barley yellow dwarf um, and in that the report uh, a very there's a great chart in here that I borrowed from that and added to it first of all what you can see from this chart is the losses that can occur depending on when infection occurs all right so and first of all wheat barley and oats are all plants that will get barley yellow dwarf it was first identified on barley so therefore it's called barley yellow dwarf even though you can get it on wheat and oats and it turns out that actually oats are more susceptible uh, than, uh, than any of the other crops. Wheat is actually the least susceptible of the three major small grain crops. But if we get infection in the seedling stages, we can get up to 50% yield losses from barley yellow dwarf. Now this is from trials where they inoculated all the plants and then harvested all those plants that were heavily infected and compared them to the ones that weren't inoculated so they had no symptoms whatsoever. So you'd have to have 100% infection at this very early stage in order to get 50% yield losses. If it occurs a month or two later when the plants are just tillering, we're down to 29% yield losses, again, if you have 100% of, of the plants that are infected. And when we get to stem elongation, all right, this is basically shortly after spring green up, when the plants are finally coming back out of winter dormancy, they start to green up, and they start to elongate. We're actually producing a, a pseudo stem, uh, a stem-like uh, structure in, in small grains. If infection occurs then, we're only looking at if 100% of the plants were infected, 14% yield losses, all right? So, and part of the reason for this, or, or parallel to this, is you practically get no stunting at this stage of the game. If infection occurs after this elongation phase, now we're talking about estimates of basically only a trace level of, uh, of losses, all right? And that's if all the plants are infected. So if you think about last season, 
The symptoms that we saw predominantly were the discoloration of, of the leaves, little if any stunting whatsoever. Maybe a few of those tillers might have been a little bit shorter, so there's, there's a, if you're really looking hard, you might see some of that stunting type of a symptom. But we're looking at the possibility of those tillers that were infected that might have gotten a trace, infect, uh, trace loss as a result of that disease. So it's really more than likely that we were in that zone of it was really hard to be able to prove if you got any losses from last year's infection, even though it looked kind of dramatic uh, last season. So um, as a result of that, where they do have a more common barley yellow dwarf kind of a problem, further south, this is a chart from Kentucky's uh, Extension Service, um, there are some recommendations with respect to how to try to reduce barley yellow dwarf by managing the aphid vector. So they do it on basis of thresholds of aphids per foot row. And within this 30 day from emergence kind of a period, you're looking at the, the lowest sort of threshold of three aphids per row foot as being a, a target uh, for uh, using insecticide to try to reduce infection. 30 to 60 days, so in that tillering period, the uh, threshold goes up because loss is essentially less likely to occur. So it's six aphids per foot. And more than 60 days post emergence, it's 10. So the threshold keeps going up. And finally, once joining begins, we're in a time period where, when insecticides generally have no discernible uh, uh, effect on yellow dwarf or on losses. So it's very hard to see a return on investment on an insecticide after jointing if, you, if we're talking about a barley yellow dwarf infestation. So the question was coming up a little bit earlier uh, in the season, uh, particularly because there were some aphids out there. Could I throw in an insecticide at jointing or with my uh, nitrogen or something like that to reduce the potential for getting some yellow dwarf? And yeah, you could, but it's unlikely you're going to see a response because if infection has occurred, you're not gonna do anything to the yellow dwarf that's already there. And if, and if uh, any prevention of any infection at this stage of the game on is at the stage where there is minimal losses due to this particular disease, all right? So that's the yellow dwarf kind of situation and story. Um, and I want, are there any questions on that in particular? Is anyone? thinking about uh, a yellow dwarf problem or had a yellow dwarf problem or saw some aphids and were concerned about that. And this is separate from, you know, if aphid population builds up, you can get some damage from aphids as well. So these, this is sort of like looking at the disease control aspect by managing that vector. All right, without any questions, let's go on to uh, the next thing that kind of is, is being popular, popular in terms of, uh, it sounds like a great idea, the question is, does it work real well? Is can we throw in a fungicide at jointing periods uh, and get some advantage from that. So we've done some trials this last couple of years and I'm kind of, I've reported on some of this in the past but I want to uh, give you an update on this as to how this plays out. Uh, fungicides at spring green up. I want you to think about the diseases that we get that can be controlled by fungicides and I want you to think in terms of splitting these into two particular categories. The diseases on the left side of this are powdery mildew and the rusts. All right. The diseases on the right belong to a second category and really represent sort of a different strategy for, for management. And these are gloom blotch and tan spot. So these are all the diseases that we can sometimes see and can have a problem with and we can actually manage with some fungicides in the absence of, of resistance. The thing is, the diseases on the left, the mildews and the rusts, are very mobile, caused by pathogens that move very easily over large distances and they also reproduce rapidly. The diseases on the right are a lot less mobile. They basically only move by rain splash, right, or hard driving rain, so that they're much more localized as a result, and they reproduce much more slowly. So the, from the standpoint of using a fungicide to manage these two particular classes or types of diseases, there's a different approach that comes into play. What's important to realize is with early fungicide use in the more mobile type diseases, you always have the potential that this inoculum or the spores can come in from, lar from, from a large distance from an outside source to come in and reinfect the field. So it's important to think in terms of how long the material is gonna last, which leaves you really are protecting, and will the strategy of reducing the amount of disease in the lower part of the canopy from this early fungicide application, is it going to be enough to carry you through to the end of the season? Think in terms of when seed treatments first came out uh, about 20 years ago that had some activity on, on the mildews, for example. 
uh, the Baytans and then the Dividends and, and, and the Raxels. When they came out, one of the advantages was that they gave us not only control of the smut diseases, but also early season control of mildew and possibly rust if we had infection early in the season. But the story had always been with the, with the C treatments is that you're not gonna get full season control, all right? So as we've, we've seen that, we understand that. So the question is now, how is this gonna play when we put a fungicide out basically mid season now at, at jointing? Whereas for the diseases on the right, which are much more localized, reproduce much more slowly, it seems that it is more likely that this early fungicide approach could have a benefit for the slower moving, the slower reproducing, the within field type sources uh, uh, diseases versus the ones that can come in and move in more quickly from outside sources. Let's examine that. Um, so the uh, growth stages that we're talking about is uh, when we come out of, out of uh, a winter dormancy, the spring green up, uh, plants basically start producing a few new leaves. Because of that, the, uh, it looks like it's starting to stand up a little bit off the soil surface. This is strictly because of new leaf formation and the green up is also strictly because of new leaf formation. At the next stage, at, uh, what we, you know, in terms of classification, it's growth stage five, we're actually producing the initial uh, head on the plants. And this is uh, illustrated here. Plants are only four to five inches high. Uh, the, uh, at the crown, if we peel away the leaf tissue and then look under a, a hand lens, you can actually see what we call the double ridge formation of the beginnings of the head. So there's two rows of spikelets that are starting to form. This is one of the reasons why nitrogen at this point in time is very important because we want to make sure that we have the full potential for uh, making sure that we uh, uh, realize the full genetic potential that's there in the plants, that, uh, that the number of, of rows of, of kernels are actually established and produced um, uh, effectively so we have nitrogen for that, that uh, plant at that time. The next stage is when we begin to start finding the nodes, where the stem is really starting truly to form and elongate. Now, it's very hard at growth stage six to actually find the nodes. You have to either peel back the tissue, because again, it's very close to the crown. It's just barely starting to elongate. You can usually feel it before you can see it. It's just a hardened uh, section of the, uh, of the stem starting to appear. And you can barely see here, again, this little brush at the end of these uh, which is the spike lid, again, that's, that has been formed at the early growth stage. So growth stage six is when we can find one node, and growth stage seven is when we can actually find two nodes, and it's a little bit easier at that stage of the game because, again, they're starting to extend more of the inner nodes and, and are being further apart, so you can see that at that point in time. Typically, we're trying to apply for, uh, nitrogen at, at growth stage four to five, the first application, and we might be delaying our herbicides till maybe to, uh, six or so, depending on whether or not you're actually seeing any, any uh, uh, weeds out there, and your second application of nitrogen also about, about six or so, maybe, maybe into growth stage seven. So there's the first set of nodes on growth stage six plants, and there's the second set of nodes on the growth stage seven plants. All right, we used to, uh, a barley uh, system to look at because of the susceptibility of thoroughbred barley to powdery mildew. We we're gonna use this as our, our model system for checking the question of whether or not we're gonna get sufficient disease control with a fungicide at early at jointing on a disease like powdery mildew. So the next thing I want you to think about is uh, what I have here is a plant at the time we have sprayed fungicide, it happens to actually be uh, the beginning of growth stage seven. So this was early April last year. We have one node at the base of the plant you could just, that's fairly easy to find and there's actually a second node in the middle of the plant that you can only find if you really do a lot of peeling of tissue or feeling for that, for that second node. So we're just beginning this growth stage seven. Now I want you to think in terms of, of uh, and there's on the right hand side is a fully mature or full height plant. It's at boot stage and it has three solid nodes that are very easy to find in the plant at that stage of the game. So the question is at the time that we're applying a fungicide, the uppermost leaf in the barley canopy at that point in time, it's very important for us to realize where that, what that is and what it represents on the, on the fully mature plant. One of the reasons this is important to understand is that fungicides are not as systemic as herbicides are, okay? So when we apply fungicide, a fungicide droplet lands on a leaf, 
The two modern uh, classes of fungicides that we use, the triazoles and the, uh, and the strobilurins, are very effective at moving through that leaf tissue that it landed on, but they are essentially only systemic to that extent. There's very little movement into any new tissue beyond that. So if, it's not, if the leaf isn't there yet, it hasn't really moved into it, all right? So the question is, what is this uppermost leaf, which isn't yet fully expanded on the barley plant, what does it represent in terms of the mature plant at the end of the season? Any ideas? We've already, I've already talked about this before, so somebody must have some idea of where we are on a plant canopy. Are we talking about, is that already the flag leaf, the upper leaf at the, t at the, uh, at the end of the season? Or is it flag minus one or flag minus two? Any thoughts? You didn't really know there's going to be a test today, right? You know, but think about that. All right, in the barley case, the good news is it's actually the flag minus one leaf. And I say that's a good news because it's very important to understand that with the small grains, the upper couple leaves in the canopy at the end of the season are the primary producers that fill the grain, all right? The lower leaves play a very small role at filling the grain head. They play a role in developing that plant to that point, all right? So this is important that if we apply a fungicide, when we have the beginnings of the second node, we're actually applying a fungicide all the way up to this flag minus one leaf. So the only thing in the canopy that's not going to be directly uh, protected from an infection is going to be the flag leaf itself, all right? So that's actually good because we're covering at least uh, a portion of the uh, significant yield producing factory that goes to the grain and we're dealing with potential uh, inoculum development in the lower part of the canopy. If we can reduce that, maybe it won't move up all the way up under the flag leaf or only to a limited extent. So this last season, we'd used large plots at the Y as well as the previous season. And we did, uh, these were 45 by 90 feet. We used farm scale equipment uh, uh, to uh, apply the materials. And uh, what I have here is a chart full of numbers. And the first two columns are disease assessments on the flag minus one leaf. We did not get a lot of disease development at the very end of the season onto the flag leaf, either because the strategy, those combination of strategies worked very well, or we just didn't have favorable environmental conditions for it to move all the way up on the flag leaf. So we had a situation where we had the real potential for getting a result from this, a response. And in fact, in all situations, whether we applied uh, triazole or a blend of materials, uh, the Stratego is a, is a blend of a triazole and a, and a, and a strobilurin at essentially that growth stage six, seven period, or at the flag leaf stage, or even later, or the combination, we basically got very good control of powdery mildew and some late season leaf rust that came in on the flag minus one leaf. And as a result, we got very significant yield increases in all but the tilt alone application that was applied at that uh, two node stage. So with a highly susceptible barley variety to, to powdery mildew, with natural limitations on disease development so that we didn't get a lot of disease development on the flag leaf, this early fungicide application strategy worked quite well in this particular case. The previous season, data I'm not gonna show you that, we did have later season development and a later appearance of, of leaf rust and we did not get any uh, significant yield responses from this, this application, all right? We got the best responses from the uh, fungicide applications made to flag leaf. Now, the other thing to think about is, if you look at this, the yield response goes up as we go to applications at the flag leaf only stage, or in this case, the combination. But essentially what we're getting is the most bang for our buck on yield from a fungicide application when we have a flag leaf. So by directly protecting the flag leaf, we got our best, essentially, um, economic return. Now, the weed situation's a little bit different. We have to consider a uh, couple things. Number one, do we have any current varieties that are as susceptible as thoroughbred is to powdery mildew, to the wheat powdery mildews? Any thoughts on that? The wheat varieties that we grow today are pretty much have at least a moderate level of resistance, all right? So first of all, we don't have anything that's quite as susceptible. The fact that we have resistance, are we going to get as good a response at the same level of disease from a fungicide 
or the same level of disease pressure, I should say, from a fungicide if we have some resistance in there? Of course not, because the resistance is going to do uh, the bulk of the work in terms of reducing the disease pressure on the plant and therefore on, on managing the disease and reducing losses. So we're working already with, in the wheat case, with varieties that have at least a moderate level of resistance, we're less likely to see as dramatic response as we did with the thoroughbred barley or the very susceptible kind of a case. But number two is, the question goes back to those leaves at that point in time. So in this case, I have a picture of a, of a wheat plant. It's only about seven or eight inches tall. This is a, the main uh, tiller in, in spring. Uh, this is after we've had the first application of nitrogen on there. There is one node on this plant that's essentially at my thumb in this picture. And the question comes at, for wheat, what does that uppermost leaf represent on the mature plant, which we have uh, kind of illustrated here on the left-hand side? So we know that in barley, we we're talking about the flag minus one leaf. We know that wheat tends to be a little bit more delayed in terms of, of development than barley. So what's your guess as to what how high up in the canopy we're looking at when we're at one node on wheat at the time of a fungicide application. So we know if it was two nodes with barley, it was a flag minus one leaf. When we have one node in wheat, it could be the flag minus two or flag minus three. So uh, show of hands, flag minus two. Anyone else think of flag minus three? You guys get win lunch today, so. Flag minus three is what it was. All right, so again, a little bit more delayed development. One, one node only showing the plants. That leaf is essentially attached to that node. Uh, we're looking at flag minus three. So we are now deeper in the canopy in terms of where we're actually getting direct disease control. We have the flag, flag minus one and flag minus two that is unprotected, all right? And this is 80% of our, of our factory for producing uh, uh, grain yield. So the strategy in this case, in terms of powdery mildew, is probably less likely to be successful, but it might still be successful for the slower moving, slower developing diseases. Here's some data on tan spot that we, that we generated. And these uh, bar charts represent the disease level that we had essentially on, uh, let's see, the flag leaf, so at, at the very top of the canopy, and we're looking at how much necrosis there is. The black bar on the left is a control, so a little over 20% of the flag leaf uh, near the end of the season has necrotic spots on it. Anything that's within this red box here is not significantly different from that black bar. And all of those are essentially uh, the, um, uh, the light blue bars, which was the application of a fungicide when we had two nodes again. So we're actually looking at protection through the flag minus two leaf and very close uh, to being uh, just, just barely uh, re a significant reduction on a couple of the treatments. If we simply delay fungicide application to flag leaf development, again, we're directly protecting the flag leaf, and even though this is a slowly developing disease, it doesn't move fast, uh, the later fungicide application appears to be a better strategy than the early, and this does translate into yields. The only significant yield responses we got were from the later fungicide application uh, kind of treatments. So once again, for, for the even slower developing kinds of diseases, the early fungicide application plays a role at slowing down the disease development. It is better than having no fungicide at all. However, you're getting more bang for the buck if you wait till you can protect the flag leaf or the upper canopy leaves. All right, so fungicides adjoining, uh, we're much more likely to see uh, uh, a response, uh, a good response, uh, an economic response if we're looking at something like thoroughbred barley, a, a variety that's very susceptible to, uh, to powdery mildew. This picture could change as resistance to diseases like powdery mildews and rust do uh, change over time. So we can get end, up, end up with varieties of wheat that'll be as susceptible given time, depending on, um, uh, on how things kind of go. Uh, primary reasons for, its, for the success in the barley situation, at least in one of those seasons, was because we were in a situation where we were able to protect at least part of the a factory that produces the photosynthate go on a grain, which is a, on the a, a flag minus one leaf. Uh, in the prior year, the data didn't show, uh, we lost effectiveness in that strategy because leaf rust came in much later in the season, so it essentially only hit the upper canopy leaves and, and had nothing to do with building up in the canopy. And the other thing to remember is that these fungicide applications, pri anything prior to heading 
is going to have no effect whatsoever on scab. So we may still be in a situation at the end of the season or near the end of the season where we have to consider another fungicide application. So you have to be thinking in terms of, of the economics of, of uh, throwing in a fungicide even at jointing, even though you don't have any additional application costs, in that that may not be the only time that you would have to apply fungicide, especially because of a disease like scab later in the season. Uh, there appears to be very little evidence that we're going to get any significant return in wheat. Uh, that picture could change depending on the resistance of the rise that we have available. Uh, if we're applying a fungicide at that late uh, kind of joining stage where we have two nodes, we're only protecting through that flag minus two leaf. And if we're applying it earlier in the, in the growing season when we have one node, it's flag minus three. And if we go even earlier, like in a couple of weeks, if we're going out there with that, that nitrogen ap application, uh, we're looking at plants that do not have a node yet. We're probably only looking at protecting through the flag minus four leaves. So, so it's the only leaves that are exposed at that time are leaves that are in the middle to lower part of the canopy. And fungicides are not as systemic as, as herbicides are. So you get a greater response and more return on susceptible uh, varieties by protecting the flag leaf directly. You can do the best, you get your best return with a single application of a fungicide uh, for foliar diseases when you're protecting that flag leaf. All right, last thing I want to mention on the small grains is scab. Um, it's a disease that, you know, that we've had uh, a little bit of a quiet period. We haven't had a big outbreak of it for a couple of seasons. You know, it can be a problem. Um, uh, and uh, we need to just make sure we're, we're all on the same page as to, as to how to best manage this. So one of the things we want to look at is Scab is the disease that causes that premature bleaching of part of the heads. You can infect, uh, the fungus that causes this disease can infect the grain, and the grain can then uh, have vomitoxin or don, uh, a chemical byproduct of the fungus growing in, in, the, uh, in the wheat. And it's that toxin that could be the reason that your entire load can get rejected at a, at a mill. So it's a very important disease from a, from a quality issue and, and uh, losses are associated with the fact that you can have the load essentially rejected and you can't sell that grain without having to save it and blend it with a, with a healthier crop perhaps the following season. So it's a very important disease, more so from the quality standpoint, the sales standpoint of your, of your crop than necessarily from a, from a yield loss standpoint. Um, last is what we want to look at is to, is to try to fine tune the question of uh, when does the fungicide have to be applied to protect us uh, from, from scab development, particularly from Don development or the toxin development, and is there uh, at least a window of time that we can apply it or is it very restricted as, as, uh, as we've been basically telling you. So this, uh, this chart basically looks at first the question of when does infection occur uh, and in terms of how and, and the severity of the disease. So what we lo look at here is scab incidence and don or toxin level and the, and the yield, depending on when we actually inoculated the plants. We artificially inoculated these plants. The untreated plants were not inoculated. One day after the first signs of flower came out, the first flowers came out on the plant is when we sprayed a spore suspension on, on the plants to, to induce the disease. Eight days after the first flower and 16 days after first flower. In terms of in, incidence or the, the, the symptoms that you can see in the field from these infections, the check was about 6%, so this is the background level that, from natural infection this, this past season. And the highest level of disease came from in, inoculating the plants as soon as flowering essentially appeared. So one day after flowers appeared, all right? Uh, the uh, eight days after, there's a slight bump, but it was, uh, and, and the 16 days after is essentially exactly the same as the background, the untreated. So uh, what we're seeing is that it's a very narrow time frame as to when you're going to see infection causing the most dramatic symptoms, all right? But there might be something going on, infection a little bit after, for a week after. And in fact, it's reflected in the toxin levels. We had very low toxin levels for the background levels of infection, the, the untreated or the 16 day after uh, flowering inoculation. And we got a bump in the, uh, a significant bump in the uh, toxin levels at the one and eight day uh, after infection. So the first thing I want to impress upon you is that number one, conditions at flowering are gonna be extremely important for infection of this disease, which we've been talking about in the past, but that even after flowering, there can be some infection. And the tricky part is you may not see symptoms all right, the bleaching of the heads, because that takes a period of time to develop. And yet, without a lot of symptoms, there can be some toxin in there. And in fact, we've had, I had some complaints a couple of seasons ago where guys said, 
you know, I didn't see any scab, yet I brought my load to the, to the uh, grain mill, and they said I had uh, vomitox in there. Where did it come from? Well, infections shortly after flowering don't necessarily produce dramatic symptoms, but it can cause an, uh, enough of infection and enough time for the fungus to grow in the seed to produce some of the toxin levels. Worst case scenario, nevertheless, is still one day after, or immediately after flowering. When infection occurs as close as possible to that, that's when we get the most disease development. Similarly, what we've already been saying in terms of the optimum timing for a fungicide is you get the most response in terms of reducing that, the closer you can get that fungicide application to uh, that time of infection. So this is a chart looking at 100% uh, uh, worst case scenario kind of a thing. So we, we took the, un, uh, the, uh, the one day after flowering uh, uh, inoculated plants and no fungicide to uh, make that bar 100% and compared everything to that. So what we have here is, um, if we look at the first two sets of, of bars after this untreated, we have the uh, registered materials Prosaro and Corumba. We get our most dramatic reduction in disease, in this case for, for the one day after in, uh, flowering infection time with the Prosaro. Uh, when it was applied essentially the day before, so the, at the at initial uh, in, uh, infection, basically. Caramba was not as good in this particular case. Yet these green bars, essentially where we uh, uh, inoculated eight days after, we are also getting some reduction in uh, the toxin level from that fungicide application made early. And fungicides applied seven days after flowering, we get we still get some control, but it's not as good as the best treatment here. Uh, so the point is, again, we do have at least a little bit of a window of time when a fungicide can go on to reduce our infection, but the closer that we can get that to the time of actual infection at the early stages of flowering is our best bet at getting a response to the fungicide and reducing the toxin level. So, um, those are the comments I wanted to make on the small grain uh, diseases and issues. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to uh, entertain, try to answer them. If you have any questions on, on corn and soybeans as well, I could certainly uh, try to answer that. Any, anyone have any questions? Time for me to start asking questions? Okay. So what's our soybean rust situation going to look like this coming season? Anyone have an idea? Have you heard anything about soybean rust this year yet? All right. Last couple of seasons in particular, there's been a real decline in soybean rust in terms of its uh, apparent uh, establishment and, and overwintering. We had a very mild early uh, winter season in, uh, in the Gulf Coast states. Soybean rust is at the uh, highest point right now as it has been in the U.S. since its first arrival. All right, so if there's a... Again, we have not seen soybean rust come up this far north, but this is a disease that we cannot totally drop our guard on, and this is a season where it's starting off as one that could be significant for soybean rust. The most likely scenario for soybean rust becoming an issue here is still going to be uh, it moving into production fields in the south early in the season and then getting some extraordinary kind of weather event to move those spores from the south further north. We're most likely not going to see soybean rust before uh, middle reproductive periods on soybeans in this area. The key though is if it does arrive any time in that middle reproductive period, around R3 or so, all right, we can get some significant losses even in our area. So we can't drop our guard. It's a disease that, that is de redeveloping this season more so than it has in the prior. It'll still take a significant weather event to move it up this far north, but it isn't totally out of the realm of possibility. You just got to think about Hurricane Sandy and realize that hurricanes do move up this far north. All right? so, so that's one situation that, uh, that could be affecting us. Uh, another one that's, uh, that's showing up again because of the mild winter, we have more rust in the, in the deep south with regard to uh, small grains as well this season than we have in the, in the prior several years. So rusts uh, are the most mobile of the pathogens that we have, and the development in the deep south is very important uh, for its potential for coming up here and becoming an issue. So again, another disease that we need to be keeping in mind, keeping our ears open with respect to whether or not we're going to have to respond to that 
uh, possibly the fungicide program to, uh, to try to manage that. All right, that's all I had prepared. Um, yes, do you have a question? I've, uh, I've seen some uh, barley plants with uh, potassium deficiencies, but with them, there are some lesions that, that look like it could be maybe a dwarf or, a, or a, a rust, but it seems awful early to be seeing that. Are you seeing any diseases in barley yet? Uh, we haven't identified any, any yet, but the uh, potassium deficiency type symptom is also the same symptom that you could have from, from barley yellow dwarf. So it is a possibility. Uh, there, is a, uh, there are some tests that are available. Uh, if you send plant sample through the extension service of the plant clinic, they can send it off to try to get an analysis and see whether or not it's barley yellow dwarf. The important thing here is that uh, there's really nothing you can do about those particular plants that are already infected. Uh, the only thing that you could possibly do is reduce any, any reinfection of new plants if aphids came in and feed, fed on those and moved, moved uh, to uninfected plants. Barley yellow dwarf this time of year. Yes, it is. It is possible to see that. And it is confused with, very often with, a, a potassium deficiency type symptom. So that's a, that's a possibility. Usually as things warm up, that potassium, potassium deficiency starts to disappear because a lot of times it's because the cold soil is a li little less able to, uh, to pick up what is there. And as the season progresses, it'll, it'll uh, essentially uh, pick up the potassium and as, as rapid growth continues, the, the, the new tissue will be green. If it's barley yellow dwarf, the new tissue will, will start showing symptoms as well. So, any other questions? Well, you better ask if he's retired, you know, you might not get him back. <laughs> I don't know. They don't seem to care. So they always, they <laughs> care about you. I know that. I appreciate coming out here. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around for a little bit while. So, okay. thank you very much. Thanks, Arm. Hi, I'm Carolyn Spiker with CNB Bank. Today also with me is Dennis Walters. We both work with uh, ag loans. The most rewarding thing is seeing farmers grow. We're partners with our loans and all the banking services. Just last week I heard from uh, Ron Collins who was an ag uh, agronomist here in Queen Anne's County. He's found employment in Iowa and he was telling me that you're at least 20 years ahead of the farmers out there. So congratulations. Good morning. Thanks, Jenny, for asking us to be back and help sponsor this. Um, I am Buddy Cahill. I work with Crow Insurance Agency out of Middletown, Delaware. We are a nationwide agribusiness agency and a rain and hail crop insurance agency. And I think what we bring a little different as our perspective about your farms is we farm ourselves. So you know, we've done it our whole lives. So when we're on your operation, I think we understand it maybe just a little bit better than some. And I will tell you, I want to meet with our clients at least once a year. And I'd encourage you to meet with your agent at least once a year and go over the policy so you understand it. If you have any questions, ask them. You know, that's the time to get things clarified rather than after there's a problem. So. Take the time, and it's for your own benefit. Thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Wayne Richard. For those of you who don't know me, I'm in charge of the Denton and East Newmarket offices. Um, I've got a list here from Kathleen Devan for crop insurance. I'll go over first. She wanted to remind everybody sales closings on March, 1st, March 15th. Um, farm credit quotes have been sent for 2013, and she included the new trend adjusted yield option on all of those quotes. And if you have any questions, make sure to call your agent before the 15th. As far as farm credit goes, we had another, another very good year. Um, expect patronage checks to be sent out at the end of this month, so you'll be getting those. Uh, our annual meetings are going to be held on April 2nd and April 3rd. Um, we're going to be raffling off a uh, gator again this year. So if you guys have interest, stop on by. Thanks, uh, thanks for all your business. <laughs> I'll just remind you again, March 15th, that's an important day for any changes or new policies. Uh, the price discovery uh, for the February average on the CBOT, corn is 566, soybeans 1291, grain sorghum 553. Uh, get your agent to send you a quote. And um, for those of you who have 10 years or more in your database, I think the trend adjustment is worth taking a look at. Every farming operation is different, so it might not work for you. 
but it is worth taking a look at. And if you don't know what that is, it gives you a, an option to um, buy a little bit of yield. If we've had some bad yields in the past few years, it might be an opportunity to buy up on some yields. So don't forget your crop insurance, people, March 15th. We're pretty excited about the trend adjustment uh, crop insurance. We went to a meeting last year, and they were talking about this in the Midwest, and I thought, oh, gosh, we'll never get this in Maryland. And lo and behold, because some people got to work and they had the information that we needed, we were able to do that. So please do check with your agent. I think that's going to be a, a big help. Mm -hmm.